Hey, hey, this is Cedric and welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. This episode is brought to you by River, the financial institution built for all time with 100% full reserve custody and zero fees on recurring orders. River allows you to buy and mine Bitcoin with ease. Build your Bitcoin mining fleet today with River. Plus, River offers unparalleled service and functionality, including tax optimization, entity accounts, inheritance planning, and instant buy volume. Use the link in the show notes to get started and earn up to $10,000 when you buy Bitcoin or miners at River. And for the ultimate in Bitcoin security and design, check out the cold card hardware wallet from CoinKite with built-in sleep at night technology. It's the only dedicated air-gapped ultra-secure signing device for Bitcoin. Or the Block Clock Mini, their second Bitcoin data display. Track the Bitcoin price, see blocks as they are published by miners, and connect the open dime to display balance, fiat value, and deposit QR codes on a timeless 7-ink digital display. What time is it? It's Moscow time. Maker of some of the most iconic Bitcoin products, such as Open Dime, Cold Card, Block Clock, Sats Card, Tap Signer, and Sats Chip. CoinKite is a leader in security and hardware manufacturer established block 141,000. Use the link in the show notes for a discount off your order. Don't trust, verify. If you're a regular listener of the podcast, There's a really easy way to show your support and help us grow. Download the Found app on your phone. Follow the Bitcoin Matrix and start listening. You can share your thoughts on this episode by sending a boost, like a payment with a message, and see what other listeners have to say or create clips of the best moments. Getting started is easy. You can top up your Found wallet with a bank card. Oh, and you can earn money just by listening on Found too. It's a no-brainer. Visit Fountain.fm to learn more. And now, get ready for an exciting episode of The Bitcoin Matrix. Our special guest, Aladdin, from Bitcoin Trading Cards, is here to dive into a range of captivating topics, from the pressing issues of the heroin epidemic and the debate on legalizing marijuana to the enigmatic story of Ross Ulbricht in the digital world. But wait, there's more. Get ready to ignite your imagination as we discuss art education, the thrill of collecting, and the power of building communities. And for all you nostalgia lovers, we'll take a trip down memory lane and explore the timeless tradition of collecting baseball cards with your dad. So fasten your seatbelts, dear Bitcoiners. This electrifying episode will challenge your perspectives and leave you craving for more. Welcome to the extraordinary world of the Bitcoin Matrix. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Aladdin is the founder of Bitcoin Trading Cards, Bitcoin Life Raft, a father of three, an entrepreneur, artist who believes in freedom for all, and wants to do this all for the kids. Aladdin, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? Uh, doing great. Thank you for having me, Cedric. I'm super yeah. excited to be here with you. I'm really excited to chat. I mean, we've gotten to talk uh, once before in real life uh, down in Miami. That was exciting. I, I've never seen so much commotion around a booth or a table, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as sort of a convention. And the buzz was just phenomenal. Um, I came by a few times. There were always people there. Um, we'll get into what you had on the table, but um, we've we've been kind of going back and forth a little bit on Twitter for like almost maybe nine months, maybe six months. But even before that, uh, Adam Meister um, put us kind of linked us together, and then I've even talked to Bob Burnett about you, and he's super excited that you're coming on the show, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So yeah, I think this is fantastic. I'd love to though. First, start out with getting to learn a little bit about you uh, and your background. Um, maybe can you tell us a little bit about maybe your sort of uh, art, artistic history or experience? Yeah. Um, 
lot to lot to dive all it goes all the way back to uh when i was actually a, a really little kid um when most of the kids were out playing running around being wild and crazy as much as i did a lot of that i i really enjoyed giving gifts and i really enjoyed seeing uh someone go home with something special so even when i was i think around six or seven was when it really started kicking in where I would be in the room, started drawing cars early on. I mean, what boy isn't into cars young. So my hot wheel collection and then putting that on paper and, and then giving those gifts to uh, friends and family that would come over and visit. And it just really grew from there. Um, I think that it was really 50% um, drawing, sketching, painting. And the other 50% was honestly writing. So I think it was in the fifth grade, we had a, a special guest come into the classroom and teach us about poetry. And I was immediately uh, very intrigued in that. And I was not like, I wasn't always the one that was excelling in school. It was, if I was really interested, then I was in it. If I wasn't, then I just did it. And poetry was one that really early on grabbed me. I think a part of it, it was I was really into girls at a young age. And I knew that poetry from catching movies and shows was one that the, the girls really liked. So I started playing around with it and just really enjoyed doing it. And it was like my art. It was a really good way to get my thoughts and feelings out and do it in a really creative way. So then it went into music and um, producing my own music. Uh, jumping on the guitar, piano, keyboard, uh, just anything I could do to create. And that started really young, where as long as I was creating something, I was really happy. Like even my bedroom, my dad uh, built the house I grew up in. And when it was time to move into my bedroom, I cleared off the entire wall, grabbed a bunch of black light paints and went to town and had this massive mural that went over the whole wall, uh, climbed onto the ceiling and really just took over the whole room. So yeah, art and anything creative was was really early on. Yeah, I can see that. So maybe growing up, anything else around maybe freedom or, you know, what was your childhood like? Did you have a lot of freedom? Was there a lot of freedom where you grew up? Um, was that something you you cared about? It was a big mix of having freedom and not. Um, especially nowadays, if you look back at my childhood, um, I definitely, one of these days, I'm gonna have to write a, a probably a novel on it with as, as detailed and deep as it goes. Um, we grew up, or I grew up with my family in a really small town in Mendocino County, and there really wasn't any cops out there, especially through the 80s and 90s. Once in a while, one would come out. So we got to do basically whatever we wanted. And obviously that has a lot to do with my dad being an, an old hippie. And we had lots of uh, family drama and crisis in the house. And um, that's a, a whole five or 10 chapters for the, the novel <laughs> I'll have to write one of these days. But um, when everything kind of went crazy with my family, I think it was about 10 years old and it just all collapsed and, and went nuts. And at that point, uh, my dad dealing with divorce and dealing with his own um, major stresses and, and heartbreak in life, um, he just allowed us to to be kids and he trusted us, which it, it worked out pretty well because for the most part, we really didn't bring home the trouble. If we did, it was usually because of a buddy we were hanging out with and the cops would show up at our door and, and come in the house early in the morning before school because uh, one of our buddies did something and we were like the frat house. So we lived on Main Street on a little farm right across the street from the school. So most of the kids that had their own family drama and, and um, so one of the things I'd like to get into today is like the, the drug epidemic and how bad it was in this tiny little town. And a lot of these kids were going through divorce at home, going through parents who were alcoholics, drug addicts, everything else. And as much as my dad was a hippie and there was a lot of pot smoking and stuff going on, other than that, it was the safest place to be for a lot of kids. Um, he always made sure that there was some kind of food for us to eat. Living on the farm, there was always something to eat somewhere. So you could go out and pick it off the tree or, or the chickens always had eggs. But lots of friends hung out at our house. And there were many, many times where our friends would get in trouble and the cops would show up specifically because they're looking for one of our friends. But other than that, dad let us just kind of run free. And I mean... To look back, I don't know if there's too many kids watching this. So kids, don't do this. But, um, like kegers and parties like that, we we got to just have it up, Cedric. We had parties where 
there'd be a couple kids that they were able to find some good mushrooms and you'd have like 50 kids from ninth grade all the way into some uh some graduates there that would show up to the party like 40 to 50 people and there would be mushrooms just flowing around and and then we would have one hell of a time but because of the community we were in everyone took care of each other and there wasn't anyone getting hurt there wasn't anything really bad going on in those situations um we really got to have it up and as much as there were some bad things that would happen here and there for the most part the way we took care of each other in that community uh, was really good the only time anything really drastic would happen or, or traumatic was when like outside communities other towns kids would come into our parties then there'd be fights and there'd be drama and different things like usual if it's your own town everyone's got each other's back the next town comes over and they move into your kager and and, and it's on at that point so freedom wise yeah. we had a lot now the opposite of that was growing up in the 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 cannabis industry and my dad was definitely a big pioneer of it um, always taught me about freedom at a very young age very red pilled um, even back in the 80s and he would tell me stories really early on and didn't hold anything back uh, my mom's side of the family uh, lots of them I grew up around um, a lot of the bikers uh, hell's angels and different people like that so I, I saw a lot at a very young age um, more things than any kid should ever imagine seeing so with that there was a lot of um drama that came along with it um parents being thrown in jail for my dad specifically for growing cannabis which literally it was like three plants in the backyard and then us knowing our dad knowing how good of a man he is he literally helps rebuild the church. He plays guitar at the church. He's community driven. He helps at the school. He's just an absolutely amazing person. And the whole community loved him, regardless of him being the guy on Main Street that grows a couple plants before anything was even close to being legal in California, before Prop 215. So seeing him be hauled off uh, for having a couple plants in the backyard when he is just a really good man those type of things struck me really hard at a really young age. I think third grade was when uh, the first time I saw him go in. And that was really difficult to see him go to jail. It was only a couple of days, I think. But even that was really traumatic because when he explained to me why, I just, I couldn't understand because of those plants growing next to the corn. Like they literally put you in jail. So those type of things I did see that the freedom get yanked away. And then that's just my own straight personal with my dad. But when it comes to the rest of my family, um, I saw many of my relatives do a lot of time for, for growing cannabis and they did um, uh, many years for it. And for as good a people as they are and the little things they did in the way of just growing a plant, um, especially when the pharmaceuticals, especially around the 90s, when Vicodin and Codeine and all those things started coming out and becoming a major epidemic, um, seeing my family in jail for a plant and seeing all these other kids at school with all kinds of legal opiates, which if anyone knows anything about drugs, opiates is uh, you take cannabis and times it by 500, maybe 5,000, and then you have an opiate, especially the addictability and everything. So, yeah, I, I did see a massive clash. And I guess that was a good thing to be able to experience what freedom is and to be able to see the exact opposite side of that as well. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot to unpack there. I wonder, you know, just right off the cuff, you know, do you think kids, it's hard to phrase it, have it better or worse today? You know, they, you know, in some ways they might have more freedom to connect with people around the world. Uh, but maybe there's also more, you know, draconian um, digital measures on them, surveillance. Uh, parents seem more concerned today, uh, managing kids more, uh, not giving them as much maybe freedom. But, you know, kids are going to be kids and they're going to do what they want. They're going to sneak it or do it or whatever. Or, you know, I'm not even saying bad or good, just they're going to be kids and you can't over manage them or, or as soon as they get out of your watch i mean who, who knows what you create but do you think families kids have it better today worse you, you know or are they up to the same thing is, is nothing new under the sun um, um i i my own personal opinion and i'm sure there's a lot of people that might disagree but i think it's a thousand times worse for kids nowadays 
Yeah, maybe a hundred thousand times worse. Mainly, I've got three kids of my own, two teenagers and a two-year-old. So I'm seeing it from all different levels and I've seen it over the years as they grew. Um, this this digital metaverse that they have in front of them is, I mean, what's the biggest problem that we have with the human race and why is Bitcoin so amazing and why is the Bitcoin journey so amazing? Because it teaches you long-term time preference if you really take your time to study it and learn it. And that's the biggest problem that we have is a broken time preference in society. And with kids having access to anything and everything at their fingertips and not having to leave their bed, let alone their bedroom, is massively um, detrimental to their their brains, their growth, everything, in my opinion. Um, at the very least, you should have to get up. It's like having the remote control of the TV. As great as that was as an invention and to be able to turn the channel to the TV, at the same time, now you can lay on the couch or the bed or wherever you're at for many, many hours without having to get up because it's just right there at the click of a button. And then they've just taken that to the extreme in so many ways. Um, the power goes out, well, you still have your phone. <laughs> so it has to be a complete... Um, what is it? Uh, uh, MP, EMP. So unless there's an EMP attack, <laughs> like we we still have access to all of these different devices. And I've seen it when the power goes out. It's like a good thing. It used to be a really good thing in the family when the power went out, because then like you pull out the candles and, and you experience something you don't get to experience very often in our day and age. But now we have the phones and it's like, okay, the power's out in the house. We've got a couple candles out, but really everyone's still sitting in their little area with their phone. And that's just sad. So I think it's definitely gotten way worse in, in many ways. Because again, it's just teaching short-term time preference across the board, not just the kids, adults. You have adults that have really strong long-term time preference, and now they have incredibly short-term because of the access that they have as well. So yeah for sure i want to revisit uh, a little bit about maybe this dichotomy of cannabis versus the drug epidemic uh you probably got to see you know a lot of both um maybe i don't want to assume too much make an ass out of you and me but you know um living in northern california i've lived in san francisco uh i would lived in i think when i was there when prop 215 passed um you, you definitely start to think about you know, the legality of this thing and how um, some people are already in jail and now you have new entrants into the market, big money. Um, we, we don't have the biggest corporations in the world yet involved, but some of these are multi-billion dollar corporations and no one's coming in with, with small pockets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are living a lifetime. You know, you could come out of jail for whatever you've done. <clears throat> You're still going to have a mark on your record you know, uh, hard to amass capital, hard to borrow, you know, compete with any of these players. Um, and then the drug epidemic, a whole other side of just, you know, drug use or, you know, what can happen. And, and a lot of people, I don't think this is true, but, the, you know, I think this is a misnomer that cannabis is the gateway drug. Uh, I haven't met too many people who, you know, that that that's kind of proven anecdotally true for me. You know, I've never seen that, but... It doesn't mean that people don't try things after they try cannabis. They were going to maybe experiment, whatever. But what what is you what is kind of your take on some of that? And just you know, I mean, I mean, this is a 20, 30 year thing with especially the opioid epidemic and just even the cannabis industry. And we're really at the beginning of it. I mean, I I think one day you're going to see Walgreens and CVS sell this, just like you know, and the pharmaceuticals are probably going to buy these big companies that will what you know one day and, and consolidate so yeah you know in a lot of ways they already have um so i was going to prop 215 meetings before prop 215 i think i was like 11 12 years old when i started going to these um with my dad and a, a lady kathy henry who was dubbed the hemp lady she drove around with this truck um promoting legal cannabis back in the early 90s um it definitely took off really quick it was specifically set up with lots of back doors 
Um, there's so much to the cannabis industry. I mean, we could we could have many conversations that could take hours just in getting into that because the corruption and how deep that goes in the cannabis industry is is extreme, Cedric. It, literally, the the sheriffs and the DEA, the DEA in Mendocino County was busted. Um, got a few years before MRSA came through, which was the big legalization back in uh, 2013, 2012, 13. And the DEA of Mendocino County was busted with like thousands of plants and an arsenal of guns that you could never dream of. Um, more things than you can imagine. And this is the guy putting people in jail for cannabis and uh, guns or anything like that. Um, I saw the corruption so bad, uh, very young age, where we literally had to get one of the sheriffs run out of town because he was literally picking and choosing who he wanted to to be mean to in, in more ways than you can imagine. Um, sheriffs in other counties that were doing things that were despicable and probably bad enough that they should just be taken out and um, hung by the community, like horrible, disgusting things. The FBI just came out, I think it was like two years ago, and raided the sheriff's department in Mendocino County because they had to put a sting out because there were so many people reporting that the, the sheriffs were busting them and then what they would bust them with would never show up in evidence. <laughs> Things that like really, really bad. We had this one where they, we called them ninjas and this was in the newspaper and it would basically bleed this black helicopter that would fly in land in people's yards a bunch of guys would get out wearing all black masked up cut the plants down steal anything that was bagged up and ready to go take your toys your guns anything that was of worth of any value at all throw it in the helicopter fly off and then no charges were dropped this happened for a couple weeks and the locals, we all went in and we reported to the sheriff. We're like, what the hell is going on? The sheriff did nothing about it. And then it's in the newspaper, the ninjas, which were supposedly law officers, but they weren't, but they didn't get in trouble and no one looked into it. So and this is just Mendocino County. Then you start going out further and further. So getting to see all of that as well. Yeah, I was I was as red pilled as it gets. I didn't trust anything authority that ever came by and that I mean even with school the little school that I grew up in uh you had the people that had tenure and those tenure teachers they literally ran that school and they would call us buzzards so we I grew up with no money and a little trailer on a farm where there's other kids that grew up even if some of them had uh, middle class families if the families were going through divorce and everything else then they were called troubled kids and we were immediately put into special education as if we were mentally challenged and we literally weren't smart enough to be in regular classes when really it was because the children that didn't have family issues at home, the parents and the teachers didn't want us associating with those other kids, whether we did anything bad or not. This started in fifth grade, like young. We're not even old enough to have girlfriends or that we weren't obviously doing drugs or partying or anything in the fifth grade, fourth grade. And they just started shoveling us into the, the special bus at that point. So I really, all of these different things early on, by the time I was in fourth grade, it was on. And those teachers had to run for their money. Like I, I pushed the envelope as, as far and as hard as I could um, to expose their corruption. And that could be a whole nother story because that one, maybe that needs to be a comedy one of these days and, and a movie made out of it because there were many uh, fist fights with teachers, coaches, all kinds of things happening in that school that really most parents and most teachers from other schools would never imagine, like unbelievable stuff. And it was really just exposing as much of their corruption as possible. Because I could, it, you can't expose cop. And they got you, but you can expose a teacher. So. Yeah, it's always fun to mess with teachers, uh, but uh, you know, not not educational advice for the kids. But and it's not a kid show. But um, you know, it's interesting as as marijuana became legal, you you kind of have this also this paradox of going from just a pure black market to now you have a white market and a black market and. California being a pioneer, I mean, a lot of states experienced, I'm sure a lot of goods fell off the truck in California. 
gotten written off by the corporations uh, and ended up in other states on the black market. And instead of decriminalizing something, you kind of create a whole legalized industry. You, you tax the shit out of it. Um, you know, you see states going through this, you know, state by state, you know, but you, you also kind of have, uh, you know, the other aspect of it is you have uh, people have the option not to maybe go into a dark alley to transact and, and do their business and, and deal with somebody who may or may not, you know, uh, doesn't have a camera on them or, you know, may not be in the light of day. And so there might be some benefits to that. And we can probably get into that in a little bit. What I want to ask you, though, is what do you mean by red pilled? Just to get a definition here. Um, uh, not trusting authority, understanding that there's much more that meets the eye. And under, yeah, I mean, that, that's probably the best way because the going down the rabbit hole, not just in, in monetary history and, and theory and economics and, and how we're being completely lied to in all those ways, but how literally the majority of the ones that are paid to protect us are doing the opposite. They're in the background uh, causing most of this. And I mean, going back to the drug epidemic, if you ever go down that rabbit hole, where did crack come from? And why was crack introduced to the de to the ghetto? And so many, the opiate epidemic and the Sacklers and how did the Sacklers get away with kicking opiates out to children. And I mean, so my daughter has period cramps and now she should be on opiates. Things like that, that happen really early on and they got to slap on the wrist and, and let go. But then you have these other people that may be growing a couple plants in their backyard. And, and then if you go down the cancer rabbit hole, which is a whole nother one, um, I'm sure a lot of people might not like, but Susan G. Komen for the cure, if you ever look into that, I mean, it's one of the wealthiest companies in the entire world and it makes more money off of donations than probably the majority of any company in the entire world and what does susan g Komen for the cure really do other than promote people giving them money like there's so many things out there that have been proven since the 50s that can dramatically help cancer and we won't go into it because you're on youtube and i don't want to hurt any of that um but yeah that's i mean there's a perfect example we can't even really talk about this because of youtube because of the censorship that you're not even allowed to have a separate opinion about these things when there's so many amazing things out there that have proven to help people dramatically. And if you can't buy it from a pharmacy, then it's deemed bad and unnecessary and it will not work. And so with, with the cannabis, one last thing to say on that, um, when it came legal to the point of MRSA, and this was the new law that came out in 20. 12 2013 passed i believe in 2014 and it was legalizing medical marijuana in california and actually getting guidelines because back in 1996 when 215 passed there were no actual guidelines really it was super gray where MRSA was coming out with new guidelines to actually help create companies and let people go fully legal and i was actually at the time i had a clothing store and a little classic car dealership and i'd completely left all of that and started my own that journey onto something completely new. And when those laws came in to effect, I had a, a lobbyist friend reach out to me and let me know. And I dropped everything because I knew that all of these mom and pops I grew up with, if they did not have something that could help them figure out these legal hoops they were going to have to jump through, they would be crushed. And they only know one thing. And that's cannabis 215 being gray did open up doors to allow a lot of mom and pop farmers that honestly the the economics of our county and everything was so dramatically corrupt and screwed that if honestly most people if you didn't grow cannabis then you didn't have money or you were middle class and you had a really good career which out there there were not many careers so it left 50 percent to 60 percent of the community with either being below poverty or growing some cannabis to at least stay afloat. So I came back to the community and did what I could, uh, partnering with uh, attorneys and lawyers and doing everything I could to reach out to friends and family and say, hey, these are the new laws. This is because they wouldn't trust an attorney. They wouldn't trust these other people. So it took someone like me that I, knowing me all their life, knowing that I was one of them, 
they definitely trusted that I had their best interest out for them. So I would walk them through it. And then I saw this new thing come up that was the second layer of MRSA, which was recreational cannabis. Boom. It was destroyed at that moment because having the medical industry of cannabis open to help people heal, to create products that were clean, that were specifically meant to help people in a, in a, a healthy benefit in one way or another. And once they took that away, then any of these conferences or cannabis cups or whatever it was, was solely for one purpose, getting high and partying. And I went to a couple of them. And when I did, I looked around me and said, this has nothing to do with helping anybody. This is everything to do with all of you guys buying your shit coins, which was basically in reference uh, to starting a quick little cannabis company and trying to make as much money on this wave as they possibly could and not caring one little bit about helping anyone out. Uh, when you grow cannabis, the roots go down to the soil and it soaks up all of the bad elements in the soil. And you can actually clean the soil by growing cannabis. So they do it in uh, China. They go and put hemp throughout all these fields that are full of heavy metals and toxins in the soil and the hemp plants will absorb that and after a few years of growing hemp in acres and acres you can go back to that soil and it's now fertile and most of those heavy metals and chemicals have been withdrawn from the ground and you can throw that away and, and you have new soil but a lot of these if not almost every single one of these growers that were growing supposedly for medical were using toxins and chemicals to grow their plant big and hardy and make it look gorgeous. And they're like, I have the biggest plant ever. And they're bragging about it when the only reason they have a plant that big is because they fed it a bunch of toxic garbage. So they were doing the opposite. Honestly, <clears throat> their cannabis, no matter how you took it, was like 10 times worse than tobacco. So once I started seeing all that, I said, I got to get out of this. And that, that's when I found Bitcoin, thank God, because at that point I was losing my mind going that the one thing I really thought was going to be a big benefit to the human race, they corrupted it to the way, in a way that allowed not the corporations to have to corrupt it, but the mom and pops jumped on board and they corrupted themselves and they destroyed it from the inside out. And you can see that in relation with Bitcoin, in relation with everything. I mean, Bitcoin, uh, the cannabis culture and what happened is literally just a small example of what's happening in so many other industries and so many other facets of humanity. And it just shows how quick people are willing to, I'm not going to say sell their soul, but in a way, sell their soul for their monetary benefit or more followers, or whatever the hell you're going to get out of growing a 20-foot a plant, or or two-foot colas, and having the biggest plants out there. It, it was a really sad time in my life, honestly. Wow. I mean, there's, there's a lot there, and I want to touch on a few of these things. So, yeah, I mean, one thing I've, I've seen... Uh, in the data is wherever uh, cannabis was legalized or, or more allowed, um, you know, other sort of prescription usage would decrease. And, and so, I, you know, I think pharmaceutical companies were, you know, huge lobbyists against sort of medical and recreational marijuana. I, I've seen, you know, the cannabis industry from different perspectives, um, you know, uh, as a corporate accounting and finance consultant, I've, I've consulted for some of the, for one of the largest public cannabis companies in the world. And it was interesting uh, seeing uh, their cost, their, their cost accounting and, and, you know, what the markup has to be beyond what they're growing it for. You know, let's say, you know, an eighth of marijuana costs a uh, buck 50 to grow and, you know, it sells for what, $60 in a medical or recreational usage dispensary with maybe 30 percent tax on top of that uh and you know there's like just and this happens in the alcohol industry oh, and, yeah. and you know there's sort of you know anecdotally you know if like a liter of vodka was a buck 75 i mean we might have societal more societal problems from alcohol 
but alcohol would be appropriately uh, priced, uh, you know, and and there wouldn't be as much uh, extortion along the way or, or rent seeking. Neither here nor there. But so, um, and, and you know, I've also consulted for some of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, and um, you know, a- after looking at the prices for what, what it costs to grow, I I started to legally grow in Illinois when I could, and. What I think you're also getting at here, though, which is, I think, really something that's not discussed. So when I when I had my my conversations with Texas Slim, it's like food has gotten, I think, 10 times worse in the last 10 years. So over the last 20 years, maybe 20 times worse, but it's just exponential. And it's more uh, uh, Frankenstein-like. And it's just, you know, all chemical-based. And I, I, I my, my suspicion... Is that's happening in the medical marijuana or the recreate the legalized recreational industry? That might have already happened in sort of the black market industry. Maybe they do things. Yeah, you know, I used to always hear in high school they they spraying it with Windex, you know, or things like that. I don't know if it's true or not true, but you know, I'm sure they did things to sort of increase grow or whatever. But you you mentioned this, you know, so sort of these high times, these festivals where everyone's going for the the biggest, baddest bud, the the most THC, whatever to all these specs and. That's not about helping the user or the patient, but about um, the picture and the notoriety and then therefore the marketing and, and the shit coinery, the money printing you can do when you have that behind you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just it's very interesting where that's all going. Uh, I want to dovetail a little bit here. Um, were you into uh, collecting cards when you were a kid? Did your dad collect baseball cards or hockey cards or something i don't know if my dad up until uh bitcoin trading cards i don't think he ever collected a card in his life (laughs) so it was uh one of my buddies that was my neighbor like two or three doors down and his dad was a major collector and i think i was first grade when i would go over to his house and he'd pull this this cardboard box out from under the bed and just packed with every card you can imagine in there. Mickey Mantles. I mean, this guy had the collection of all collections and that was where I first started sparking into it. And then being able to, it was really, I think the first cards that I got was a friend of my dad's who was collecting um, Marvel comics cards and I love comic books. So when I seen his stash of Marvel comic cards, that really fired me up because baseball cards, I was always into sports, always played sports from a really young age, but uh, those were cool. But when I saw Marvel cards and I saw the artwork on these cards, that's where I really got fired up because I could just stare at those for hours and hours. And then they really did a good way of making the, the Marvel superhero chicks look absolutely gorgeous in those cards. So I like that even more. And uh, really got into those cards, collecting baseball cards, uh, football cards. Those are the two sports I played. So I was most into that. Um, The passion kind of dwindled over the years when got older and it really started coming back a little bit, just watching my kids with Pokemon cards and seeing the excitement they had for those and then seeing their short-term time preference with that and really trying to teach them about like, maybe you should play the game that there, you know, there's a whole game to these and they would play the game if they had a buddy down the road that knew how to play it and they wanted to play. But for the most part, they just collect them and wanted to look at them, which was cool. And put them in their little binders and everything. Um, I think where I really got fired back up was when I created Ganja brand trading cards And that was in like 2013, 2014 and first released in 2016 and basically ran those batches in order to get uh, small mom and pop farms product to dispensaries in a legal way and just help them with their marketing because that's the number one thing. If you got good marketing, then you, you got a good chance. So that's where I really started getting fired back up and doing just a lot of research into trading cards across the board from magic, the gathering, the sports cards to the whole traditional market all, all around. So I couldn't just start study one area of trading cards. I had to go all the way back to the, the 1870s, 1880s when trading cards first came out and learn about the fact that they were, that's what really fired me up about Ganja brand cards. They were a marketing tool. 
first and foremost, before they were anything, you you would get that uh, cigarette card in your pack. And that was a way to start to advertise for uh, different uh, baseball players back in the day. But it was really a way to get people to buy that brand of cigarettes because they had a chance to get that special baseball player in that brand of cigarettes. So they weren't even buying the cigarettes anymore because of the cigarette brand. They were buying it for the the baseball card brand that they were going to find in there. And I said, holy crap. Well, tobacco, cannabis, trading cards, all this kind of just fits really well. And I need a legal way to help these farmers out. And that's where I really drove back into the cards the most was at that point. All right. So yeah, I'm super excited to get into this. So I grew up collecting cards. My my father collected cards, everything. My brothers collected. Um, I really enjoyed it. I gave it up or you know moved on, but I've been rekindled over the last year in some ways. Uh, not to collect more baseball cards, but to to look at the ones I have and to think about what they mean to me. And thinking about cards in general. Um you know, touching a little bit more on the cannabis. So one of my favorite uh, podcast episodes was when Jack Mahler's, his dad and Bitcoin mom were on uh, what Bitcoin did with Peter McCormick. And they talked a lot about because Jack's dad was, you know, legendary in the commodities market in Chicago. And uh, they, they moved to Denver or Colorado, wherever to retire. And they got into getting into the cannabis industry. One of the things that was really interesting about what Jack's dad, because uh, Jack's parents weren't uh, cannabis users per se um, for, for their life, most of their lives. But um, as proprietors of the of the company, one of the things they, they noticed uh, amongst their consumers, the difference, they said, Jack said, you know what the difference, Jack's dad, the difference between medical and recreational users, what is the difference? Eh, nothing. There's nothing different between the users. And I think that's really important to note. And um, what... I want to hear a little bit more about as though um, more about the ganja trading cards. Like wh- how, like, what, wh- how'd you get into that business? What did you find out? Was it hard to ramp up? Um, what were the cards like? Uh, what was the response from the community there? Uh, yeah. When I first had the idea, honestly, it was, I was out in the garden watering some plants and the idea just popped in my head and it was one of those aha moments and then I immediately ran in the house and wrote down my notes. And then when I was done in the garden, I came in and started researching on the computer and just digging into it. Cause I mean, I didn't know anything about creating trading cards, collecting them, but I had no idea what it took to create them. So just started digging and digging, coming up with all different kinds of ideas. The main point of it was when you're a mom and pop farm, you're trying to get your product to a cannabis club. Uh, in a legal way or anything like that. Obviously, it's got to be legal to go to a cannabis club. And that's where you're going to stay in the market because you're leaving the black market, you're moving to the white market. So you've got to travel in your car with cannabis on you, which at the time was illegal, even though it was legal to have to grow cannabis and legal to have a brand and everything. It's illegal to put it in the car and drive it. So it was there was a lot of gray areas that were just crap. And you're taking a risk with every single step that you do. So now you're throwing illegal cannabis in your car because the moment it's in your car, it's illegal and you have to drive it in multiple bags, which is totally illegal because it's sales, even though legally that. So (laughs) your big risk to get to the club to hand them samples for them to try and test and see if they want to put it on the shelf. And you got to give it to them and then you're going to have to give it to another club and another club and another club and you have to make all these samples and you're giving out a lot of your product to all of these clubs and you're spending days and days traveling from club to club taking a massive legal risk every time you do it a lot of these mom and pop farmers were moms and pops they were literally parents and every time they do that they're taking a major risk of not being there for their children not just for the day that they're gone but if something happens on the road they get pulled over they get arrested so big big risk in this and your margins are shit because you have to give that product to the club and i know a lot of these club owners and a lot of them were literally like making some decent money not a whole lot but they were making decent money on just collecting samples because it's free samples and when the price was still good if you could collect 
10 different farm samples in one day at each farm is giving you two ounces, there's a pound, pound and a half a day that you're collecting for free every single day coming in. That's a decent little uh, margin to be able to play around with. So these cards were specifically so that you could take, okay, I grew five different strains. This is the elevation I grew it at. This is the year it was grown. This is the phenotype. Um, here's the test results from the lab. So I would get it tested at the lab. I would have the actual test results from that particular strain they grew that year. Everything dated, everything like really in a fun way. You'd have a picture of the nug growing live on the plant because when you're seeing it in person, it's obviously dried and cured, but a lot of people don't get to see that, that wet live bud on the plant. And that's when it's the most beautiful. So integrating all that into the card, then you have the high, the taste, the smell, uh, all those different things so that you really just wanted to try it. And then I'd put them in the packs and they would go in the box and it was really professionally done. And then these farms could literally drop ship their samples without ever having to leave their house. They could call the UPS guy. They could call the, the USPS and have them pick up boxes. And for 50 bucks a box, 100 bucks a box at the very most, they could drop ship these cards all over California to clubs all over California, to cannabis cups, to conventions, to you name it, and really get their brand out there in a way that these big corporate guys, I mean, they're not stoners. They're not like old school uh, hippies. They don't have that creativity in them. So I knew this was something that really needed to come from the original hippie crowd. And it did really well. People love them. All the naysayers, when I showed up with that pack in their hand and they ripped wax, and these are people that never ripped wax, probably haven't ripped wax since they were uh, young teens, like 12, 13 when they were into it. And they loved it. And th they did really well. But again, at the same time, by the time I finally got it out, because it took me about two years of planning and working to get them out, um, I was over it at that point. I, the passion had left me. The industry had just left me really devastated. And like you said, there's no difference between uh, a medical user and a recreational user, but there's a major difference between a medical grower and a recreational grower. That's the biggest problem that I saw. So it wasn't about teaching people the benefits of cannabis. It was just how high can you get? And that, it just saddened me because I was in it for the fact that this is a life changing medicine. And the more that I saw the corporate takeover, the more that I saw uh, the, the corporate younger, like you had a guy in the Bay area that I'm not even going to mention his name, but I'm sure a lot of people know who I'm talking about. He literally was just a trust fund baby and he wanted to throw his money at something that would go really well. <laughs> smoked a lot of pot and he created a brand and he knew nothing about pot. He'd never grown pot, knew nothing about the industry, could give two shits about the industry or anyone in it. And because he had the money and he had the backing in the Bay area with people that were willing to promote him and make t-shirts and really get him out there. Now he's one of the biggest brands in cannabis and everyone's like, this is the OG. Oh, it's not in any way and it's just that those were the type of things that just devastated me and that's when i really started looking at the general public going if we can't out market these bigger guys then obviously they're going to go with what's marketed the best it's it's gucci it's prada it's you can't compete so I, as much as i had a lot of plans and i had a lot of really um really fun things going it was time to pick my family up and leave. And again, thank God at that point, I was really discovering Bitcoin and it's like, dude, this is a no brainer. And I never thought I would leave and just get up and walk away from it all. But Bitcoin to me was such an aha moment when my wife said, I found somebody because um, she does hair that is willing to like, they're moving out of their house and we can move into this place. And it's a great deal and it's a great opportunity. And I was like, I think that day I said, let's pack it up. Let's go. And we sold the majority of what we had there, sold the property and packed it up and moved. And then, so what, what was your Bitcoin journey like then? Uh, we kind of glossed over it a little bit there. I mean, how'd you come across it? Um, 
what did you think at first? And yeah, I mean, it, it inspired you to move. So, um, you know, how did that ramp up so quickly? So uh, like many people that I've heard and, and talked to in Bitcoin, um, heard about Bitcoin in 2012 and some guy had hundreds of Bitcoin. He was going to trade me for a pound of weed. <laughs> And of course, I'm like, what the hell is that crap? And he couldn't, he didn't explain it right at the time or anything close to it. So obviously I passed on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of those, like many people have that story, but uh, 2016, a good buddy of mine uh, just started talking to me about it. And around the same time, my back had started going out for the first time. And I went to this chiropractor and the chiropractor started talking about it. And he goes, Hey, have you ever heard of this Bitcoin, this Litecoin? Like, no, I never, I, well, I think I have, but no, tell me about it. So he started getting into it. He didn't know much other than number go up, really. But I was really intrigued. And at the time, I really didn't have much money because everything was going to the business, but I was highly intrigued. Um, obviously, I think the number go up for the was the first thing for me because not knowing anything else about it, I heard his gains that he was making and it's uh, something I got to look into. So I started digging. And I think Tone Vase was one of the first podcasts I watched. And there was a couple other Red Pill podcasts that I watched. And I was hooked within the first episode because what they started talking about was bringing the power back to the people. And for the first time, having a money that was the people's money that could not be inflated, that could not be controlled by the government. So I was immediately like, this is something that gives us the power back. And I started diving into every podcast I could watch. And at the same time, I went red pill deep. I This was like 2016. So obviously the Trump and Hillary elections going on and all these different things. And I don't, I'm not a politics guy, but I am a pay attention guy. And I'm paying attention to what's going on. I'm hearing these stories. This Bitcoin rabbit hole brought me to this rabbit hole, brought me to this rabbit hole. I'd read The Creature from Jekyll Island many years earlier. So I reread The Creature from Jekyll Island, um, started diving deep into like the FICO credit score and how that crap works and all of these different elements that revolve around the monetary system. I was so hooked, Cedric. I literally... Um, I used to listen to music all the time in the car and I traveled a lot. I no longer listen to music in the car. I listen to podcasts. That's, I mean, to this day, I rarely, and being a musician myself, not listening to music, but once in a great while is really strange. And when I hear music, I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> but I'm so into learning and just soaking up as much as I can, all of this missing information that so many of us are like lacking. And once you get hooked and you start getting in, it's more enjoyable than any movie. I mean, the, the, the world right now, especially since 2016 till now is gotta be one of the most epic movies ever written. Mm. Like we're, we're living the script of all scripts right now. So being able to live and be a part of that, if you dive in and you embrace it, with education, the fear starts to go away. And I think most people are afraid of this script that's being written because a lot of it is a horror movie in so many ways. The epidemic, the pandemic, like all of these different things, it's like the horror movies we've been watching for all these years come to life at our front door. But if you're studying and you're paying attention, then it's not as scary as they're trying to make it out to be. There is Bitcoin and there is hope. And if you surround yourself with nothing but fear, then that's all you're going to feel. But if you have enough time to dive into all of it, you'll find the hope because the hope is out there. The hope is you. The hope is Michael Saylor. The hope is the plebs in our community. There's so much hope that is out there with so many amazing people that once you start to find that, it makes this journey enjoyable. And it really gives me inspiration like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. Feeling that, wow, I, I, I actually know a lot. And that's a very uh, attractive thing for human beings to, to know something, to know the secrets. And what was, it's the secrets of life we're looking for. Every You don't have to know the secret of life. 
but every little secret of life that you learn is empowering and beautiful. So you stack them up. And I don't think any of us maybe will ever get to the point where we know the secret of life, but just stacking up all these fun little secrets feels really good. And that's why we get so inspired to talk to people about Bitcoin. Cause we're like, Hey, did you know, <laughs> like that's probably our, our number one thing. Hey, did you know? And it feels so good to be able to say that and drop some awesome truth bombs. Yeah. Well, speaking of truth bombs and, and the secret of life. So my wife and I, we actually watched uh, some documentary on the secret of life with the secret. Uh, I, I fumble around the secret of life. My wife, I think it's just natural. Um, but we, one of them was like the law of attraction and, you know, kind of like thinking through that, but, you know, talking about dropping truth bombs, <clears throat> these Bitcoin trading cards, you know, these are educational truth bombs and, and some secrets to life. And, you know, over the year that we, we you were first brought to my attention from, from tech Meister, tech ball, Adam Meister, smash that like button to, you know, oh, so you reaching out, uh, you even reached out. You said, you know, Adam said, just reach out, just do it yourself. And that really inspired. I, I like when people reach out. It means they really want to talk. They really got something worth talking about and they believe in it. And uh, over that course of that year, though, you know, trying to figure out why I want to talk about baseball cards again. That's how I kind of thought about it right away. Like, you know, and I'm I'm moving away from the physical world. I'm, I'm collecting sats here. Uh, why do you, why are you trying to get me to collect, you know, my baseball cards? But I moved to Florida to spend time with my dad, but he, but he died after I got to Florida a few weeks after I got here. But, um, uh, around that time he gave, he gave me a Michael Jordan rookie card. And, um, then I, I, I went in the garage and I found all the baseball cards that I had collected that I kept that um he had either given me or i got my on my own most of me gave me my favorite ones and they were in his garage he was holding them for me and so i i whipped those out and i and then you sent me a couple of packs of bitcoin trading cards and that's what lit the fire in a lot of ways um, i'm looking at these cards now um i mean they're they're stunning this is the Zim zimbabwe what is this, the trillion dollar bill uh this one's awesome and one of my favorite ones the the 21 million because I just think that's the most important thing about Bitcoin. The white paper, creature from Jekyll Island. Uh, these are really cool. And I started holding these and thinking about the physical implications. I started thinking about my Michael Jordan record card. You know, but oddly enough, my, my father also gave my other uh, brother, um, and I have a couple of brothers, but uh, a Wayne Gretzky rookie card. And he started trying to figure out what to do with it. And that kind of just brought up a lot of, things about bitcoin you, you know scarcity you know these are things i learned as a kid with these you know trading cards i want this one you got that one how easy is this one to get i rip up these packs i remember when you sent me the packs i i, I sat there it, it felt like an eternity but i was like i don't i shouldn't open these i shouldn't open these i really know i shouldn't open i'm gonna open them i'm gonna open one okay you know, and then you, you want to rip them all. And, and they're so exciting. And you know, you're, it's like kind of driving the car off the lot. Like, you know, you lost 30% in value. <laughs> well, maybe you pull the rare card and you gain some value, you know, and you get the thrill, but uh, you want to see what you have. And, um, and then, you know, my brother went through the exercise of trying to sell this valuable card and found out it wasn't even real. You know, and that's a whole rabbit hole. Um, you know, you, you go through this grading process. Uh, they got to verify your card, validate it. Mm -hmm. I, I think this whole thing's insane. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa I'm going to send in my million dollar card to you. And I'm going to trust you to send it back to me when you find out that it's the million dollar card. I, I stipulate, like, come on, like, you're not going to send me the half a million dollar card back or the $70,000 card back. You know, and then you find out your card's not real or something. Like, well, wow, why isn't it real? How, how do you know? Well, we can't tell you. We're not going to let you know. We're not going to tell the counterfeiters uh, how we figured it out. You know, but we're not counterfeiters. Uh, you know, uh, you could track down an off-duty FBI agent who might explain to you that it's, it, your card is tops, uh, but it's printed on FLIR paper. 
Um, you know, and I know what Fleer paper looks like, and I know there's a Topps card. And, um, I, I went to a card show, you know, and um, it's just a stat. I mean, a lot of people trading bad paper for what they think is better paper. Um, but the whole ra- the whole industry is a racket at this point. I mean, nothing is rare anymore. Yeah, hundred you know, percent. You can buy these cases five per household. Um. You know, you DCA into your favorite quarterback uh, rookie card. Uh, maybe he gets hurt, you know, or signed to the Bears. That's no good um, <laughs> as a quarterback. You know, uh, you know, DCAing. Like, what do you what do you get? A thousand of this guy's card at four bucks a pop, hoping it runs up, and you could sell him at what a hundred dollars. But where's your liquidity? Um, you know. But at the same time, man, I, I love my my Bitcoin trading cards, you know, and I'm, I'm sitting here with my baseball cards. I want to sell all those, but I, I, I want to trade some of these, some of my Bitcoin trading cards for the ones I want, you know, a little more. And I want to, so I want to get into this. Like, how'd you launch this? Like, is there a team that you work with? Um, how do you come up with the art? That's, I mean, we're, we're going on five years now, uh, four years, maybe a little over four years that was just planning uh 2017 so when i first got into bitcoin i was flat broke moved my family and just from the sale of my house had enough money to keep us afloat until i figured something else out Um, i've never had a w2 in my life other than two weeks where i built children's furniture when i was like 18 or 19 and said yeah it's not for me so I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, and I I can't see myself working for anybody else because if I can't be creative, then I can't be happy. And if I'm not happy, what's the point? So I knew that when I moved the family, I had to start a new career, whatever that was going to be, which was a new business, a new startup, whatever that was going to be. Really enjoyed the trading cards, really enjoyed proving everyone wrong which that's what the cannabis cards really did. Um, but I said, I, I want to just work in Bitcoin, whatever I do, because from a very young age, my ultimate desire was I want to do something that's going to help change the world. So one of these days I might kick out some of my music and, and get it out there on YouTube or something. You could tell in my music and my poetry, my ultimate goal, my ultimate purpose in life was to do something that would help benefit the world. And even music I was writing and poetry I was writing in the seventh grade, eighth grade, when I really started writing almost every single day. Um, What can we do to fix the world? How can we help the children? I'm a child singing about helping the children. And when I found Bitcoin, it was like, this is the, the one thing that could potentially be the catalyst to help change the world in a better way so obviously if there's anything i could do it's this i thought it was going to be music because i was blind when i was younger thinking that uh, musicians were the ones that were helping to change the world because my dad loved the beatles and um hendrix and and all the good stuff back in the day but then you start finding out secrets Mm -hmm. and rabbit holes about all those guys Mm -hmm. like oh well i guess they're not big heroes or anything like that either i want to do a show on that one day (laughs) yeah those go deep bob dylan uh literally sings about selling a soul to the devil I'm not saying not getting all um um hmm. gaudy or anything like that on anybody but th- there's a lot of deep crazy stuff out there yep. crazy hotel stuff. california you diving, yeah you start diving into it and you're like holy crap so yeah these musicians probably are not out to uh, help make the world a better place and uh, many things like that so bitcoin back to that that's where i said this is where i need to be and then the trading cards and all that was already something so the idea was i'm going to make some really fun bitcoin trading cards and they're going to teach things about bitcoin well at the time i didn't know everything about bitcoin i was still learning for myself i figured that was going to be a win because if i'm highly intelligent and know everything there is to know about bitcoin then i'm probably going to be like a lot of the podcasts i was watching in the beginning where i just stood there stunned and confused the whole time because it was right over the top of my head So I had the idea of me not knowing much about Bitcoin. I'm going to create cards that are basics that I need to know, which is going to help the people that are basic like me and need to know the basics. 
And as I started getting it more and more, I said, okay, that's a good idea, but I need to know a hell of a lot more before I can even do that. And I started the Bitcoin life raft, which was my wife telling me, if you don't shut up about Bitcoin or find a way to monetize it, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> so I had to create something where I could at least charge uh, a rate at some point like i'll talk to you about bitcoin for a few minutes if you're interested then we can set an appointment go meet at starbucks and you can pay me by the hour to teach you about bitcoin and it was literally teaching there was no financial advice ever that i gave anybody because that I, I understood all of that um did that for two years had a log wrote down all of the wins when I would bring up something where, and I'd pay really close attention to them because this wasn't necessarily just about teaching them about Bitcoin. It was filling my log up for the trading cards. So I'm watching their eyes. I'm watching their expressions and, and how they'd go. And I had a list of different like key points and I would drop them and then rate their feedback and judge their feedback and then write that on my little notepad. So I had a good idea of what sparked them what interested them what made them just completely lose interest and want to walk away from the conversation and i compiled that into this project that you see here bitcoin trading cards and i mean i gotta be honest cedric i when i first launched so i gotta bring my my partner in real quick because about a year before we launched i got to the federal reserve card and i was done i was ready to give up how the hell do you write a description of the Federal Reserve in one paragraph? Like that's the biggest undertaking ever. One paragraph to describe the evils of the Federal Reserve. Holy crap. So I was almost done and I called my buddy and I said, um, would you be willing to jump on this project with me? I will do whatever it takes. Meet with me once a week. Just like listen to me and give me feedback. Highly intelligent, super amazing guy, freedom fighter to the hilt. Uh, he jumped on and then that's where it really started taking place and then back to where we were. We never thought that it would really be collectible beyond maybe 10 bucks, beyond maybe a few people pass them around. This was specifically meant to be how do you talk to friends and family about Bitcoin without talking to friends and family about Bitcoin. And you could just give them a pack and let them get interested, let them get started. We got Tone Vase, we got the Adam Meister in the first series. So they find the Adam Meister card. Who is this? Oh, it's super collectible. There's only a hundred of these Adam Meisters. He must be someone really big. Oh, his podcast is right here on the back. Oh, here's all of his links to social media. I'm going to go check out Adam Meister, who is one of the greatest characters in the history of Bitcoin once people get to meet Adam, uh, greatest guy ever, love Adam. So those are the type of little things where they're slowly getting introduced and you don't have to overly talk them and spill your guts and, and annoy the crap out of them or a lot of the things that us Bitcoiners do when we talk to people about Bitcoin that don't wanna to be talked to about Bitcoin. And then within like two or three weeks, uh, it just, blew up we had a couple people really interested and then it just started going nuts and people loved these cards more than we ever imagined and yeah two months later we sold out and me and my partner are sitting there looking at each other like what the hell just happened we were hoping someone would buy two packs not two boxes <laughs> i mean it's it's astounding beyond i mean one i was offended when you used the word basic to describe i was offended for you i mean these cards are beyond way beyond basic these are these cards are phenomenally produced the paper the artwork that i mean i underestimated everything about this project when i heard about it because i was like how how are they gonna you know whip out from the beginning like uh, a real professional thing or just uh and it like i, I said before emotionally it lit a fire but i mean just objectively the the card is produced really well um, and the artwork is amazing. So I want to read. I, I pulled the Federal Reserve card. I, I have it here. Um, it's a favorite of mine. I got a bunch from Series 1 that I'm really excited to have. Um, so I want to read the paragraph from this one because you mentioned it in particular. So this is under government. 
This is series one, number 42. So I guess there's a hundred of these, or I don't know if they vary in series one, how many there are. So if that's a common card, there's 1,936. I believe. Okay, so 1,936 of this is number 42 in the series one. So this is under government. Uh, it says the Federal Reserve System, also known as the Fed, is the United States of America's central banking system. Surprisingly, the Fed is not government owned, but rather a private bank. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 effectively outsourced U.S. currency to a group of private bankers and signed side by side with this IRS with the IRS Act under President Woodrow Wilson. Thus began the process of converting the value of the U.S. dollar from the gold standard to the arbitrary values of fiat money. We are now beholden to a system that places control of an infinite economy in the hands of a few powerful individuals. The Federal Reserve creates fiat currency out of thin air, devaluing the dollar and causing debt and def inflation. What, what I not only under underestimated there is just the, the quality of the card itself, the artwork, but the message, the educational part of it. You know, um, what it reminded me of is, you know, one of the reasons I got into card collecting in the beginning wasn't for the value of the card. It wasn't just to have my favorite player, but to learn the stats as a run the numbers kind of guy. Um, it was really exciting. Who at the most home runs? What did this guy do last year? What was his batting average? Uh, to look on the back of the card and get educated, to learn about something I was interested in versus whatever they were teaching me at school, uh, which uh, wasn't always or usually wasn't that exciting. So, um, and, you know, playing sports as a kid, you learn how hard these things are. You know, I hit eight home runs last year. I batted 372 and not 500 like Tommy or whatever, you know. So, um, and I, I mean, I mentioned the Zimbabwe card. My other favorite one's uh, the white paper, uh, 21 million. I'm thinking about giving one of each of these to my, my brothers um, because it really, uh, but I don't want to let go of them um, as a collector. But. So I'm going to be jealous the moment I give them to him. But uh, I'm thinking about giving one of my brothers my favorite card, which is the 21 million. But I think because I think it could actually be impactful. Um, because you might be interested in the card from the front and then turn it around and read it. And and, you know, I think that's one of the ways that we can actually get the general public involved. I think that's what what you're going for. Um, but to kind of loop around a little bit here, um, I want to talk a little bit more about maybe the scarcity of these cards. I mean, also, you know, you have cards. I mean, you have to kind of deal with storage. You know, some people buy like a walk-in safe in their home or, you know, now you're back to the $5 wrench attack or you put it in the bank and now they could take it or you got to send it in grain, all these different things. But these cards are so electric. I, I just want them for myself. I just want to have them. And, and like I said, I hold them, look at them, trade them. So this brings me to uh, Ross Ulbricht. And we were talking about a few things. I mean, you know, just in sort of, you know, what people can do with their money and they can buy what they want. I think Ross grew mushrooms to be the first product on Silk Road. Um, but I think you guys have done uh, some work on, on on Ross or Free Ross's behalf. And maybe you could share a little bit about that and, and sort of the scarcity behind that. Yeah, um, we, obviously with my background, Ross's story and, and his situation is is highly close to my heart. Um, I, w me and my partner immediately knew that at some point we have to have a free Ross card. And the, the cool thing about it is the more it gets out there, the more people collect these cards, the more they go on eBay and everything else. Uh, hopefully it sparks more people to go, who is this Ross and what is the free Ross card? And that's the point of these. Like you said, it's educational and you're collecting the sats and, uh, you start looking at it and, and questioning. And there's a lot of people that don't know a lot of these topics that are in these cards that are Bitcoiners, which is really cool. Finding so many people that have reached out and said, I didn't know so many of the things that I'm learning in these cards. And um, use the word basic again, but I'm I'm a basic Bitcoiner. <laughs> so to have different things that I've learned that a lot of other people don't know is a really good feeling. And I, I'm, I'm onto something with that because I feel like so many of these Bitcoiners know everything there is to know about Bitcoin. They know a lot more than I do about Bitcoin, but there's always more to learn. So the free Ross card is one of those where I'm really hoping we get the word out as much as possible. So he's a common card in series two. Then we put him in the 
21 club. So the 21 club is the rarest cards you can find in series two. There's only 21 of them of each of those cards. So there's 21 limited edition free Ross cards. And then he's a common card throughout the series as well. And then we did a super limited edition one of one free Ross card that we put up on auction for scarce city and donated all the proceeds to the free Ross foundation. And we wanted to do that because as much as we can give back with this project as possible, that's the whole point. It hopefully generates some buzz around free Ross and the, the foundation, Ross Albrich and what he's going through and just sparking as many people's minds to this situation as possible. And it went really well. It was really cool. So Tommy that does the war bonds, he did the artwork for it. Um, there was some artwork that Ross had done that people had seen that he did in prison. Tommy basically sketched over his artwork, um, obviously on another page, and he kind of copied Ross's artwork and then laid that down beautifully on the work that Tommy did himself. And we did a venticular card where when you turn it one way, you'd see the, the artwork that Tommy had copied and then of Ross's work and then we turn it the other way and you see Tommy's art and it was just a really special card so that was a one of one and we were able to generate almost eleven thousand dollars in bitcoin that's being donated to the free Ross foundation and where was that sale held uh scarce city or scarce dot city so it's a bitcoin collectible marketplace Really, really great team of people that put this on. They're Bitcoin only. Uh, you can only buy in sats, which is really cool on there. Uh, just a great idea put on by a really great team of Bitcoiners. And they they do it right. So being able to work with them on that project, they're all really close to, to Bitcoin, the ethos. And obviously, Tommy and the Free Ross Foundation, they'd already donated to multiple times. So it was just the perfect connection. So tell, tell, uh, how did your connection with Scarce City come about? What what exactly, I mean, is it like an eBay for Bitcoiners? Kind yeah. of, or or people who can spend Bitcoin, they don't have to be a Bitcoiner, just want to buy yeah, things. It's kind of like an eBay for Bitcoiners to be able to buy Bitcoin collectibles and, and bid on them. They've got different bids going on at different times. And like, so when we do our auctions, I think it starts today and it ends on Thursday. So it's like a two day auction and it runs for two days. And then you get down to the wire on Thursday at 12 o'clock when the auction is over. And every time someone throws a new bid in, like right before the timer is up after 12 o'clock, I think it ups the clock another five minutes or so. And it's really turned into um, kind of a event in our community where even if you're not bidding you're just kind of following it because it's really fun and you know some of the people that are bidding on it and it's it's turned into a really fun experience all the way around i think that's really what these cards have done more than anything is it's community building in so many ways it, it pushes people to make peer-to-peer -peer transactions. There's been so many people that said, I've never used the Lightning Network until you're trading cards, but I really wanted to buy some common cards off this guy. And he told me he would only accept it uh, in SATs uh, in a Lightning payment. So I had to go and download the wallet and learn how to use Lightning and, and make the payment. And so many of these stories coming back that is just beautiful. It's, it's pushing people to actually use Bitcoin. And people that have been in Bitcoin for five, six years that are going, I'm actually using it for the first time. And it's it's doing its job. It's doing it better than I ever imagined, honestly. Awesome. All right. Well, I want to dive into this a little more. So I I, I did open my, I ripped open my packs and uh, I want to know what I'm holding here uh, a little bit. And so I, I got the white paper. Um, how many of these? 1,936 of these? Yes. So the That's only it. ones, so all of the commons you have in series one are 1,936 of each of those until you pull a foil card, like the Zimbabwe dollar, the one that has the, the foil effect. So this is not a common card, the Zimbabwe dollar. That is not a common card. So, you know, if you turn that and you look at it, you see. Yeah, no, it has a, something going on. Yeah. So it's spot foil. And that one, there are uh, one, 999 of those. Nice. That's it. That's one of my favorites. What about something like 21 million? 
So that's another common card. But if you find it's pretty low in the series, I, I get a kick out of having, you know, the low numbers. Just well, so what number you're looking at there is the card that it is in the series. Yeah. Not the... No, so I get that. Like... I get it. It's not like Stratego. Yeah. Or like, no, but I still like that. I got a low number. Yes. Uh, you know, regardless. Yeah, because card um, number one uh, is always the. the I don't think I, I didn't get card number one. I think five was my my lowest. One was uh, actually a Pacific Bitcoin. Uh, oh, I have that one. Um, how many are there? That one. So that's Pacific in series Bitcoin. one. So Pacific Bitcoin was the commemorative pack. And you oh. could only find that card in the commemorative pack that we gave away at Pacific Bitcoin. Well, I have that card. But that's number one, you said, like number. Well, there was uh, there was two different foil cards that we did to just kind of give you a little bit of a chase. There was the the surfboard and the van. I got so the van. I think, I, I think the van is number one, and the surfboard is number two. So yeah, and that's a rare one. So there's 999 of those, and those actually the value the community has put on those is just so. Crazy. So like, if I wanted the surfboard. Is is just as rare? Would yeah. that be an even trade? And I'd be like, be even trade. I got to find somebody who wants a van. If I wanted the surfboard, I'm sure there trade. are people out there that would do that. So, what is the community like? What's the trading like? What's the bidding like? Because I'll tell you. So, first of all, the website sold out. I'll let people know when there's more inventory. It's not fully sold out. We'll we'll go go to the website. There's still some stuff, but it's almost sold out. The booth you had at uh, Bitcoin Miami, I mean, it was insane. Uh, people were coming by. You were selling everything, but people were just like, how much do I have to overbid to just let you you give me it all now? I mean, you know, let me be the one, the one to buy it all and don't have any more to sell. And it's like, dude, I, I want to bleed this out. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I it's almost like in Germany, they don't want houses to go above market, you know, for whatever economic reasons. It might make sense. And so it's like, yeah, I bought this house for 500000 and, and the registration's office is like, no, go back and tell the seller we know it's only worth three hundred k, and and that's where you got to end up around. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was just, a, a, you know, running fast. It was something like hotcakes, if you will. So what is the community like? And what is the trading like? And what is the dialogue like? I mean, I want to get into this trading. I, I want to have fun. I have some doubles. You know? the, the community is addictive. Let's just put it that way. Um, all absolutely amazing people. Uh, it is on Telegram, and before this community, Telegram to me was just uh, scams and and bullshit for the most part. Uh, really dangerous place to be if you don't understand scams and the crap that's out there. So I have a hard time telling people to go to Telegram and and join our community because the just the bad crap that's on there. But um, it's amazing that our community eats scammers alive. The moment they come in, they're they're ripped to shreds. And there's been a lot of people that are not scammers, and it takes them quite a while to make it into the group and establish that they're not scammers. And they're like, man, you guys were so mean when we first started. But like the questions they would ask and do certain things, the community, it's a lot of people that have been in Bitcoin for a long time. And they've seen all kinds of crap and all kinds of scams. And they are very protective. But at the same time, they're just as protective over you and new people as they are themselves they're incredibly helpful they're incredibly fun and funny i mean the jokes that run through this community the people from all over the entire world in this community literally uh first series we sold out in two months we did no advertising and 30 percent of our sales were international um series two sold out in almost two months not two months sorry about three weeks just under three weeks were for the most part sold out and again like 30 percent of our sales are international like it's just an amazing community of bitcoiners from all over the world that love trading these cards that love playing with these cards love the chase there's so many fun videos all the time of people opening their packs. We got people that are making crazy videos where they literally drill a, a, a big screw through a pack on a 
a big uh, piece of wood and then take a chainsaw and open up their pack with a chainsaw and pull the cards out and all kinds of fun, crazy, awesome stuff going on in this community. And that's the greatest part. We have really found a way to make Bitcoin fun. And I've said this in almost every podcast and I say this almost every time I talk to somebody about these cards because it's the most important aspect of what we're doing here. We are in Bitcoin because we are afraid of how crazy the world is, because we admit that the monetary system is broken because it is broken, because there are so many horrible things happening to this entire earth and our communities. It's sick and sad. So we are gathered around Bitcoin as hope. We're gathered around Bitcoin as a community to work towards the, the embitterment of the human race and our children, as Greg Foss says, for the kids. We're on a mission to help make this world a better place. But man, it is a struggle because there's so much bad shit that we have to constantly fight through every day on this mission. So to have something that can bring some joy and some happiness and some fun to this mission is I think highly needed. It's it's like an army and they're on the battle lines and they've been battling for the last two weeks and they take their one day reprieve and they're in their bunkers and they're playing cards. They're doing something other than thinking about the battle that they've constantly be in, been in for day after day after day. On your day break, do you really want to talk strategy? about the next day and the next battle or do you want to just be able to hang out with your buddies drink a couple beers play some some poker and turn it off for a moment so i think that's a lot of what these cards have done cedric it's given the ability to turn it off for a moment but at the same time still be on the mission which i think is a really cool combo yeah and i think you've created you know the pokemon for bitcoin here uh, you know, something that's very highly desired and you seek out. I want to read some of the backs of some baseball cards, uh, of cards, Bitcoin trading cards and baseball cards. Um, so starting with uh, the white paper, where it all began. The word Bitcoin was defined in a white paper published on October 31st, 2008 by Satoshi Nakamoto, the synonymous individual or group responsible for Bitcoin's creation. A white paper is a report or guide that informs readers concisely about a complex subject as well as presenting a philosophy and framework for thinking about the issue. The Bitcoin white paper introduced the concept of a decentralized cryptocurrency to the market, changing the course of history in an exciting drama we are all a part of. This document is quite possibly one of the most important papers in history. Quote, writing a description for this thing for general audiences is bloody hard. There's nothing to relate it to Satoshi Nakamoto, the white paper, 2022, the Bitcoin trading cards, series one, number seven. Next one I'm going to read is Willie Mays. Played outfield in the National League, whether it's at the plate, in the field, or on the base path, Willie excels at what he is doing. The giant center fielder was the National League Rookie of the Year in 1951. In his first full season with the Cubs, with the club in 54, after coming out of military service, Willie won the batting title with his 345 mark. The following year, the exciting star had another fine campaign as he led the NL with 13 triples and 51 home runs. Quick as a flash on the bases, Willie stole 40 bases in 1956. The pride of the Giants had his greatest day at the plate on April 30th, 1961. When he crashed when he crashed four home runs in a game against the Milwaukee Braves. <clears throat> it isn't just talk when a sports writer says that Willie has Willie rises to the occasion. In eleven all star contests, the dyna- the, dy- the dynamic ball player has compiled a four twenty five batting average. Frederick von Hayek. Influencers. Quote A claim for a quality of material position can be met only by a government with totalitarian, totalitarian powers. Frederick August von Hayek, Austrian-born British economist, noted for his criticisms of the Keynesian welfare state and of totalitarian socialism. Hayek believed that the prosperity of society was driven by creativity, entrepreneurship, and innovation. 
which were possible only in a society with free markets. He was a leading member of the Austrian School of Economics, whose views dramatically whose views differ dramatically from those held by mainstream theorists. Hayek was regarded as one of the most brilliant and influential economists of the 21st century. In quote, we shall not grow wiser before we learn that much that we have done was very foolish. Frederick von Hayek. This is uh, series one, number 33. Um, one of my favorite cards, Mike Bossy. Uh, it's a rookie card from New York Islanders. Uh, he was six foot. Weighed 180 pounds. He shoots right. Mike enjoyed perhaps the finest rookie campaign in NHL, NHL history last season. He established a new league record by scoring 53 goals as a rookie, included in his total with 25 power play goals as he won Rookie of the Year recognition. Along those lines, we have 21 million. My favorite card that I pulled. Total Bitcoin in circulation at the point of production of this car was 19,103,119 out of a total Bitcoins to ever be produced, 21 million. Bitcoin was designed around the principle of a finite supply. That means there's a fixed upper limit on how many Bitcoin can ever come into existence. That finite supply is set at 21 million Bitcoin. Bitcoin's limited supply is a huge advantage because it keeps the cryptocurrency scarce, helping to maintain or increase its value for years to come. Bitcoin is quickly becoming a global currency and store of value. And with a population of 8 billion, owning even a small portion of one Bitcoin puts you ahead of the curve and places you in a great advantage, places you in a great advantage point by holding a portion of the world's first finite asset. And Michael J. Saylor said, Bitcoin is the most efficient system in the history of mankind for channeling energy through time and space. This is series one, number five, which is pretty cool. I mean, you know, it, you read them alongside baseball cards and things like that, and you kind of get this added impact of trying to experience it maybe from someone who doesn't get Bitcoin, you know, and just being interested in the card and, and picking up what's going on. So I, I want to ask you, you know, why are you so concerned about our children's future? <laughs> you sure you want to open up that door? <laughs> um, I mean, here we are. We're talking about baseball cards and, and you're doing it for the kids, like, or trading cards, I should say, you know, Bitcoin trading cards. But I mean, there's so I'm much other things you could do just to, you know, earn a living to provide for your family and not worry about the greater future of, of the children my children and other people's children and everyone else's kids. You could just take care of your own, you know? Um, so, I, I mean, it goes all the way back to the beginning when we were talking about my freedom as a kid and getting to experience that. I know what freedom is and I know the opposite of it. And I'm incredibly blessed to have got to experience the freedom that I did. So, giving as much of myself to the chance that other children can enjoy maybe not the same type of freedom that I had, but just freedom in general is incredibly important to me. And I see the difference. The difference is insane, honestly, at what we had in the 80s and 90s compared to now, and then what my father's generation had when he was a kid and it's just getting worse and worse and it's expanding out all over the world. I, I've got friends in Africa, I've got friends in South America, I've friends all over the world. And I mean, even with as afraid I am for my children's future in the U S <laughs> we take it all for granted because when you look at other countries, the struggle is it's heartbreaking. And one of the biggest things that I tell people about getting into Bitcoin is if you're not getting into it for yourself, if you're not going to take the time for yourself to do it because you're comfortable and, and you have what you need, then get into it to help support other countries. Because like going back to the many things we talked about, it all, it all, it, it's all relative. Susan, you're coming for the cure. You're donating your money to 
a group that's taking maybe 5% of it and actually putting it towards what you gave them the money for. Bitcoin, you could literally dollar cost average Bitcoin for your own family, for their own future. And at the same time, you are helping to strengthen the network for families all over the entire world. Like there's never been a charity that is quite like Bitcoin in the history of the human race. We are, we have hope. Maybe without Bitcoin, maybe there'd be plenty of other things that I'd be doing right now because I would be just focused on their personal benefit, their personal future, and that's it. But I have so much hope in me because of Bitcoin. Hope for not just my kids, but kids all over the entire world to change this horrible downward spiral spiral that we have been in of corruption and by throwing an equal equalizer out there is the best opportunity for the entire world and i really want to see in my time or at least my kids see in their time the the chance to have that equalizer come out somewhere and if one country can do it look at el salvador look at the the sats they're putting out right now it's it's amazing and hopefully another country will jump in soon and another country and another country and be the examples for the potential that is out there there's no reason we should have widespread spread poverty there's no reason we should have people starving on the streets and homelessness there's no reason kids in Africa should be starving, period. Like anybody that just does the basic research, there is plenty of resources all over this world to make sure every child goes to bed with a full belly, to make sure every mother is set up to help their baby and their infant as they grow in the first six months to a year and give them the education they need. We are in abundance of every resource we could ever imagine. This earth was specifically created to give us everything we need at our fingertips. As you could literally walk, I think it's this, I used to read up on this a lot, within, back in the day, within 20 feet in any direction you would walk outside, there would be some kind of a herb for your ailment that you might have in that particular area. This is the most beautiful, amazing, incredible earth that anyone could ever imagine it's it's beyond like science fiction it's beyond fantasy we are so blessed to have what we have on this earth to wake up in a sunny day and feel the warm sun to experience a rainy day and just the emotions that we get to feel the sad emotions even that that's a beautiful thing every one of these amazing experiences and feelings this is all gorgeous we are all so blessed. The only sad thing is that there are people that have no access to the most basic of resources, like food, like basic medicine that honestly, back in the day, it grew naturally in the ground, very close to you. You didn't have to buy it. You would have the, the grandmother of the village would walk maybe a mile if she had to, to the furthest point of the river where these certain herbs would grow that would heal one of the worst conditions that would happen in the village. Like we're in this most perfect environment in so many ways that we've allowed, but, but we have allowed a handful of creeps to crush it. And to me, that's so not fair. And, and I guess a lot of it is I watch Braveheart like 200 times easily and William Wallace I've got some Irish in me so and some Scottish so watching that movie growing up I mean those were the movies that inspired me more than anything and it was so bloody and and so harsh we literally can pull a William Wallace right now without shedding a single bit of blood like that's what Bitcoin is it's the non-violent revolution it's this this amazing fantasy that we're living right now that is reality and that's where these cards like just wait until we go to the next level and the next level all of this is being done like for the most part 
I, I'm I'm ninety percent of doing this, and I'm stretching the the burning the midnight oil, I guess they call it, and putting everything I can. But as we grow, as my team grows, as the community grows, because they're giving me input, um, that's one of the greatest parts about the community. Everyone has their input, and it's loved and appreciated. And so many people come up with so many amazing ideas that are going into this. So it's going to be better and better and better because we have like four hundred and. 50 members, 430, and they're all collaborating with us. And there's little little uh, cutout groups that have come from this and collaboration groups and collectors groups. So all of these groups I'm jumping in and being a part of, and I'm soaking it up. And it's all going into these cards, all these ideas, because we're literally like living the script, like the script that's being written. So the shitty script that we've been living for so many years we're literally like writing over the top of it in a permanent marker right now with Bitcoin, which is so cool because I, from everything I've studied, these creeps have been writing this script for hundreds of years and they've already written it out for the next hundred years. And it's supposed to play out like this and it's going to play out like this. And then here us Bitcoiners show up with a really thick permanent marker and it's orange <laughs> And we're just writing over the top of their script and they don't know what to do right. And the more of us that have the cojones to constantly write over the top of their script and make our own script and say, I don't care what you've written. I don't care how long you've got this laid out. We are sitting on the most amazing, nonviolent, real, true love revolution that anyone could ever dream of. So I know I went on a big tangent of your, and I said, don't open that up because that's where I really get crazy passionate. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll do whatever it takes for my kids, for your kids. Uh, they deserve it. No, oh, I love that. That was epic. Uh, keep them coming. Uh, well, speaking of scripts, uh, I do want to read a little bit more from the back of these uh, Bitcoin trading cards and, and one baseball card, but uh, you know, thinking about like how things are scripted or the way things are going. Uh, I want to first look at the, you know, the Zimbabwe dollar that we've been talking about. It's $100 trillion uh, from the reserve bank of Zimbabwe. And on the back of this card, it says Zimbabwe, $100 trillion bill due to relentless money printing and political turmoil. Zimbabwe experienced a period of hyperinflation spanning a few decades that culminated in 2008 with the introduction of the $100 trillion banknote. Currency in Zimbabwe was so devalued that you needed a big stack of high denomination bills to buy a loaf of bread, whereas only a few short years earlier, you could buy a loaf of bread for less than one Zimbabwe dollar. At one stage, a $100 trillion note would not even cover a bus fare. Due to continuing hyperinflation, the Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe dollar was discontinued and transactions are now made in various other financial, uh, other foreign currencies. Peter Drucker was quoted as saying, the ultimate resource in economic development is people. It is people, not capital or raw materials that develop an economy. And this is in series one, number 23. Um, reading about Derek Jeter um, and his, uh, he was a 1992 draft pick. Um, Derek declined a scholarship offer from the University of Michigan to sign with the New York Yankees, the holder of all but one offensive record at Central Kalamazoo High School. He belted three home runs in his first three games last season. Derek possesses an extremely strong arm. He's been clocked at 90 miles per hour in, in throwing from shortstop to throw first base. He has good range at shortstop, and his foot speed is excellent. Derek had a 3.82 grade point average, finished 21st in his Central High School class of 2000 of 250. Uh, I think I was 34 um, of like 242. But uh, you know, Derek got drafted by the New York Yankees. He never got traded. Got signed to big deals. Uh, some people said he wasn't even like the best shortstop ever. You know, but in in talking about sort of script, you know inflation is sort of natural and organic to all fiat currencies. Uh, but Bitcoin um, has the having programmed in or scripted in algorithm algorithmically. So the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin, the having. 
the percentage of total Bitcoin mined is 90.9, 90 90.97% as of when this uh, card was released. And the current halving uh, rate is 6.25 Bitcoin per block. A Bitcoin halving occurs when the reward for mining new blocks is halved, resulting in miners receiving 50% fewer Bitcoins for verifying transactions. When Bitcoin first began, miners were rewarded with 50 Bitcoins per block. The block reward is halved every 210,000 blocks, mined roughly every four years, and will continue to halve until the block reward per block reaches zero around the year 2140. A reduction in mining rewards reduces the number of new Bitcoins on the market, increasing the assets value and demand. This is in series one, number eight, uh, the halving. Um, I mean, these these cards really speak volumes when people uh, pick them up and touch them and uh, you know think about them as more than just something you know that you could buy online, but when, when they receive them. So, I mean, I'd love to ask you, how has Bitcoin changed you? The biggest is what I think I've been talking about quite a bit. It's hope. It's really given me hope more than anything. Um, the number go up things. It, it, so when I when I called my consulting from the Bitcoin Life Raft, I really look at it and I, and I tell people this too, especially friends and family. They go, well, what, what are you going to do if Bitcoin fails and it doesn't work? <laughs> I could be completely wrong, but my personal opinion is if Bitcoin fails, then we're all commies and it's a socialist society and it doesn't really matter anyway because they're going to give me my stipend and everyone will have a stipend and I won't be able to own nothing and I'm supposed to be happy anyway. So at that point, what does it even matter? Like It's, it's the life raft that we're all jumping on as Bitcoiners for a hope to be able to get off the sinking ship and have a chance to float to an island, float to the mainland somewhere and, and not have to go down with the ship. Didn't really have a whole lot of hope before Bitcoin. And I think that's where a lot of people sit. I've got so many people that have went down the red pill and learned about a lot of these really sad situations in our history and, and many things that are disheartening and that ignorance is bliss that's very true um i know a lot of people that would rather not know and it makes sense because if you're not willing to do something about it if you're not willing to work towards something better then why would you want to know all of these things it's a lot easier to stay comfortable mark moss is so great he, he throws some wonderful stuff out there one of my favorite things he said is a lot of why a lot of people don't embrace freedom is freedom comes with a lot of responsibility. How you are free and you have to make your own decisions and your own choices. But with that comes the responsibility of making your own choices. And that's a scary thing for a lot of people. You have entrepreneurs that don't want someone to tell them what to do. And you have a lot of people that I know personally that don't want that. And that's a very scary thing for them to not have to not know what they're supposed to do every day. I want to get up and have my job. I drink my coffee. I get ready for work. I go to work. The boss tells me what to do. I follow the orders throughout the day. I get it done. I get to come home, turn on my TV and kick back. That's fine. I've, I've always, because I've had a lot of friends and I'm like, come on, we're going to try this. And they're like, no, I'm sticking with my job. I'm like, yeah, but it could be really big. And they're like, no, I'm sticking with my job. So that risk is scary. And, and it's the risk of freedom at the same time. It's the risk of success. It's the fear of success as well. And I think that that's a big thing for a lot of people. I think a lot of people fear success and a lot of people fear freedom. So if there's anything Bitcoin has really done, it's taught me that there is a lot to be hopeful for. There's a lot to be thankful for. And there's a lot of people out there that feel the same way we do. And that's a great feeling to not feel alone. That's one of the worst feelings in the world is to have all of this uh, knowledge and feel like you're one of the only ones that does and you're the alien in the crowd. So to have some people that you could find that can relate to you, it, it's a great feeling. So I, other than hope, 
it's the community that has just been absolutely incredible that drives my hope that much more. Right. I'm talking about community. Bob Burnett said, I, I had to ask you to tell me the story of the mother Satoshi card. <laughs> Love it. Um, probably going to go down as one of the most incredible cards ever created. And a very few people know this, but we, with this project, we plan on doing things that have never been done before. We plan on pushing the envelope and really breaking the mold when it comes to trading cards. So I, Adam Meister also introduced me to Bob early on, which Adam just is the man in so many ways. And me and Bob just completely hit it off. He has given me so much amazing advice. Um, I feel like he's the, the mentor I wish I had throughout my life. Absolutely love Bob and Lola, incredible people. And got to meet him in person for the first time at Pacific Bitcoin. And he's looking through the cards and he goes, man, you, you really need some more female influence in there. You're spot on. I, and, I'm, and we're working on making more of that because there's still a lot more that needs to be put into it in that way. But I had started studying about him more and more and found out that his wife was a professional bodybuilder. And I'm looking at the, the statue that I made or the figurine. It's Satoshi's gift, which is the um, mascot of Satoshi's trading cards. And I was like, well, why don't we make a female Satoshi? And no one knows who Satoshi is. We don't know if it's a girl, a guy, a group, like no one knows. And as a creator, one of the funnest parts about this project is Satoshi, because I can really get crazy creative with Satoshi. And I said, well, can we make your wife like the female Satoshi? And of course, Bob loves his wife more than anything in the world. So uh, it jumped right on that one. And then we started the conversation. I got to meet Lola. Um, started talking about it, made multiple sketches, had multiple meetings going over all kinds of ideas. Who is the female Satoshi? Um, just getting really deep in that. Then Bob dropped this amazing thread on Mother Satoshi and how if Satoshi, but Satoshi is like a mother creating this life and then gifting it to the world and allowing that life to go out to the world and become what it was going to be and be able to step away and allow it to take its form in whichever way that was going to be only like a mother could do and sparks just started flying in my mind and i mean bob just home run all the way on that one so we had to dub the card the mother satoshi card um, Lola is obviously an absolutely amazing mother, or grandmother, just a beautiful, beautiful person. So she was the absolute perfect person for this card. So not only did we go super deep into the design, the idea and everything in this card, but then Lola started training um, many months before we did the card to prepare herself for the photo shoot. And then the amount of energy, I was blown away when Lola and Bob sent me the images from the photo shoot. So professional. I My jaw dropped to the floor and I could not believe that they'd spent that much time and energy on not just the training, but this photo shoot alone with hair designers and makeup artists and multiple photographers and everyone at a, a beautiful place that they did the shoot. So we took the images, which were hundreds and hundreds of images of Lola that got taken that day, and then picked the one that we liked the best. We came up with the idea of her holding up a ball, which would be the Bitcoin in her hand, and then holding a chain that would show the strength of mother and the strength of Lola and her proof of work in her body. So she's holding this heavy chain up and then holding the Bitcoin in her hand. And that was the one that was just perfect. And then because we didn't have the costume made in time, I had one of my favorite artists that did the having card and he hand sketched the design that me and Bob and Lola had come up with for this costume over the top of Lola's image in this picture. And we produced the Mother Satoshi card off of this. So the amount of time and energy that went into that one card, as far as I can tell in all of my research, it's got to be the most time ever spent in a single trading card. Especially with Lola's months and months of training and everything to produce this card. It's absolutely magical, incredibly special card. Wow, that sounds phenomenal. Um, I mean, who who's your favorite? 
artist. She's right here. Oh uh, yeah. Well, that. speaking of, I, I, I mean, when Bitcoin trading card posters, I want the one on the left. I got FOMO on that one. Uh, <laughs> I want to lead my little girl into you know the valley of freedom like that. Um, who is your favorite artist? Oh, it's so hard. So when I first started this, I was doing all the sketches myself and I was imagining that I could do all the artwork. And then after doing, I think, three or four cards, I decided there's no way that I'll ever be able to scale <laughs> if I have to do all the artwork. So I jumped on Instagram and different platforms and just started digging for I'd like hashtag certain um, styles that I liked and just dug around searching for artists. And then I'd reach out to them and I'd ask them what they do about Bitcoin. If they didn't know anything about Bitcoin. I asked them their thoughts on freedom as long as they were um, welcome and open to the idea and they believed in freedom over the opposite. Um, I started the conversation and I've got artists from all over the world that I work with right now. And it's been life changing for a lot of these artists, which is really cool. Some of them have been able to start their own little businesses, hiring employees for their own art project. Um, favorite artist is really hard. I've got two guys that are in. Columbia. I mean, pre, not with the Bitcoin training. OK. Cards, just... <laughs> it's going to have to be Robert Crumb. And um, has he been involved with the project at all? He just jumped in series three, which is kind of unimaginable to have him uh, jump in and, and give us the time to be able to do that. Uh, he's almost 90 years old, I believe 90, either almost 80 or 90. He's been he's in the top 50 artists in all world history. The guy is one of the biggest freedom fighters there is when it comes to artwork. He probably could be the biggest freedom fighter. Um, of all time when it comes to artwork because he pushed the envelope more than anybody else for freedom of speech and and everything along the lines of freedom of expression they tried to shut him down multiple times they tried many many bad things to uh, put this guy down he's i i dub him as the elvis presley of the art world um shaking his legs when no one was supposed to be shaking their legs <laughs> he's very iconic and i got to grow up with his uh both of his children in this tiny little town, which is just amazing to have that opportunity. But yeah, uh, Robert, not just specifically for his artwork, because I love his style and everything, but it's more just for what he represents as a human, as an artist, period. Right. That must be really great to have him part of your collection. It's incredible. Uh, so my, my final question for you, I mean, this has been so dope. If you could orange pill anyone in the world with one of your bitcoin trading cards who would it be and which card do you think would do it it's hell of a question would this be a like what if this was someone who's already into bitcoin but like orange pilled to where he is now it could be someone you know, it could be someone no one knows, only you know, it could be personal, it could be famous, it could be dead or alive, whatever whatever you want. I, you I, could orange pill anyone with one of your trading cards. So it's someone I'm already working on, and I'm doing everything I can. I actually put a bounty out on this guy to try and specifically orange pill him already. So with the size of the bounty that I've put out to try to get him into Bitcoin and into these cards to work with us, I'd say he's probably got to be the number one, uh, Mr. Beast. And Mr. Beast, because he's got such a massive audience, he obviously has touched on the youth. He's a very giving person. He does all kinds of charity, all kinds of giveaways, as far as I've seen, which who knows, but he seems like a really good guy in a lot of ways. My kids have been watching him for years, and his influence on the younger community is massive. And if there's anyone that I could get, and again, I'm working on him specifically because if I could get him into these trading cards and ripping some packs and into Bitcoin, I think we would have one hell of a flood of the youth getting into Bitcoin. I see where you're getting at here. Uh, for he, I'm new to the scene. I only heard about him recently. I'm a little, it's a little sus to me. He's risen a little too quickly, gotten so huge. I don't know who's behind him. 
but I totally understand what you're saying with the influence. Like if anyone could see the Pokemon or sort of a trend or a fad or just get the word out and kind of touch a lot of people. Yeah. And especially in the, the modern era, the digital age of how information moves and, and things are seated. I, I totally get that. So this has been so dope, Aladdin. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit about Bitcoin trading cards before we roll out. So our education fund, Bitcoin trading cards are designed by world-class artists in the Bitcoin space. The back of every card features educational facts about Bitcoin. Bitcoin trading cards make education and collecting fun. This is bringing the physical back to a world gone digital. Most Bitcoin education tools are online. Uh -huh. However, these digital methods of learning remove an element of camaraderie and fun. Bitcoin trading cards enables immersive interaction in the physical world to educate about the most important invention in human history. The first decentralized monetary system with a fixed limited supply. Their mission is to make Bitcoin fun enough to spark the interest of the next generation to learn about the power of Bitcoin. Aladdin, this has been so dope. I'll leave it to you for any parting words and let people know where they can find you and Bitcoin trading cards. Um, we're most active on Twitter. I've, I've got some people that are helping out now. Uh, one amazing person, Alani, who is like a super fan that turned into uh, uh, one of our team members, which is really cool. So Alani's helping out on other platforms that I uh, hate being <laughs> on because I don't like social media, period. Um, so, but she's doing a really good job of reaching out with all of that. Um, the website is btc-cards.com. Definitely check out the Telegram group. It's incredibly fun. We've, we've touched on that. Um, community is incredibly warm and welcoming. And um, yeah, those are the main places to find us. I guess what I want to leave off with is my favorite quote. And it's a lot of what inspired me um, with this project. And that is, it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen on setting the brush fires of freedom in the hearts and minds of men, Samuel Adams. And that is hopefully if we can just play a little part of that amazing journey with these cards and that amazing mission. That's the mission we're on and that's where we're going to keep pushing and pushing and put our heart and soul into this baby because it doesn't take a majority, it's a minority and we can get it done. Hey, hey, let's fucking go. Thank you so much, Aladdin. Love it. Yo, that's a wrap on today's episode of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. We hope you found it informative and engaging. I'd like to take a moment to thank our listeners for tuning in and supporting us. I couldn't do it without you. If you're interested in supporting the show, there are a few ways you can do so. You can leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform, which helps us reach a wider audience. You can also stream the show on the Fountain app and boost it for sats. And finally, we're always looking for sponsors who align with our values and mission. If you're interested in partnering with us, please reach out to me directly at cedricyoungleman at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. <laughs>